Brethren, as was mentioned earlier, we have for our consideration today the topic of conflict management and accountability. Now, I know this may seem a little out of the box uh, for the normal um, discourse topic, but my prayer is that as we progress through the lesson of this hour, that you're able to relate to the insights we will consider as it applies to your daily spiritual walk. So we open our lesson today with the scene of Apostle Paul and Silas in prison together as we read about it in Acts chapter 16, verses 23 to 20, sorry, 23 to 35. Apostle Paul, in this context, was in the middle of his second, second missionary journey when he and Silas were imprisoned after casting out a demon from a slave girl in Philippi. Brother Russell, in reprints 3123, page 380, says the following. Under the circumstances, the false charge, without proofs, was sufficient to bring down upon the Lord's representatives the severest penalties their judges could inflict. Their clothing was torn from them, and the command was given that they should be beaten with rods and imprisoned. The customary sentence of the time was, Go, victors, tear off your garments, scourge them. This was one of the three times Paul was thus beaten. See 2 Corinthians 11.25. He referred to it in his letter to the Thessalonians, declaring that he was shamefully treated in Philippi. So 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 2. The prison was constructed with outer cells, which were more or less accessible to the light, uh, and air, and with an inner or central dungeon for the most vicious criminals. It was into the latter that Paul and Silas were thrust, and their feet made fast in the stocks, which often were so constructed as to separate the limbs widely and to make any movement very painful. End quote. So, brethren, here are men experiencing conflict. They were beaten, mistreated, unjustly thrown in the inner prison or in the prison at all. And when we think about normal human being, uh, human behavior, there are generally three possible responses that a human has when facing conflict. And the first two are very often uh, re recalled uh, flight and fight. The fight means that you oppose the conflict in that situation. Flight means that you escape from the conflict or situation. Now, the third response, possible response when dealing with conflict is, is not as well uh, remembered, which is freeze or the deer in headlights reaction, which, which speaks of inaction in, in that situation. Now, the question here we have is, how did Apostle Paul and Silas choose to respond to their moment of conflict. Well, we see that Paul and Silas began to hold a praise and worship service in the middle of their dirty, depressing accommodations. I'm not sure that's the response most people would have in these chaotic circumstances. Being wrongly accused and treated in such a despicable manner, I think most people would be crying with anguish, which would be the freeze response or threaten to retaliate, which would be the fight response, or even change their occupation, which would be the flight response. But to have a devoted worship set in the midst of such terrible, uh, such trouble, just simply blows my mind. When things are crashing around us, it's usually not the time for worshiping our Lord, or is it? That's the question that we must ask. In this story of Paul and Silas in Acts chapter 16, verses 23 to 35, we're given some real insight into how, how we should respond in seasons of turmoil and trouble in our lives. Conflict is defined as an incompatibility between two or more opinions, principles, or interests. 
We all know that conflict is a part of life. Jesus did promise in John chapter 16, verse 33, that in this world, we would have trouble. And in his letter to the Philippians, Apostle Paul wrote that you are given in this battle the privilege not merely of believing in Christ, but also of suffering for his sake. Philippians chapter 1, verse 29. So brethren, how do we respond to conflict? Remember the three possible responses that we have innate in us, fight, flight, or freeze. The way that you and I respond to conflict has a lot to do with the circumstances that shaped our character. Take, for example, an immigrant child who did not naturally fit in with his peers in school. His circumstances and life experiences have led him to become a people pleaser. Now, dealing with conflict for him is not easy. Even the very thought of confronting conflict makes him anxious. So here we see how the circumstances around us, the experiences that we go through, can play a huge role in how we deal with conflict. So the first takeaway that I have for you is Conflict is inevitable in all aspects of our life. Now, I was very fortunate uh, to attend a training for work recently. And at this training, uh, we did something called a TKI assessment, um, the Thomas Kilman Conflict Mode Instrument Assessment. This TKI assess assessment, it assesses an individual's behavior in conflict situations. That is, situations in which the concerns of two people appear to be incompatible. In conflict situations, we can describe a person's behavior along two basic dimensions, they claim. The first dimension is assertiveness. Assertiveness means the extent to which the individual attempts to satisfy his or her own concerns. And the second dimension is cooperative, cooperativeness, the extent to which the individual attempts to satisfy the other person's concerns. Now, these two dimensions of behavior can be used to define five methods of dealing with conflict. Now, I know this is a lot, so stay with me here. These Five conflict handling modes are competing, collaborating, compromising, avoiding, accommodating. And when you look at these five conflict handling modes, they fall on a spectrum. And what do you think my behavior in conflict situations was profiled as based on this take TKI assessment? Well, no need for any guessing. Here are my results. Now, looking back, I'm not very surprised that these were my, re my results. As you can see, the three uh, prominent modes in my behavior is accommodating, avoiding, and compromising. Now, what does knowing this about my behavioral tendencies unlock for me? What does similar insight about yourself unlock for you? What I learned is that while these are the behavioral tendencies that I tend to default to in times of conflict and distress, they do not have to define me in all circumstances. Take my work, for example. I work for a prominent aerospace company in their IT division as a product manager. And in my role as a leader of men, I am not afforded the opportunity to deal with conflict in an accommodating, avoiding, or compromising way in every and all circumstances. There will come circumstances when I will have to choose, the key word there is choose, to be collaborating and competing 
when I know that I need to drive the best decisions for the team and for the company. So essentially, what we are understanding here is that there is no room for judgment in conflict resolution, but there is room for compassion and curiosity. When we find others behaving a certain way in conflict, and it could be any one of these five modes of dealing with conflict, competing, collaborating, compromising, avoiding, accommodating, when we find one another behaving a certain way in conflict, the biggest mistake that we can make is to think we know why. So brethren, knowledge is power. And you can use that to take advantage of yourself or someone, or you can view it as an opportunity. Well, you may ask, opportunity for what? Well, I would like to frame that conflict is an opportunity. Every conflict is an opportunity. It is an opportunity to either repair and strengthen the relationships that we are, that are healthy and valuable for you, or to identify potential harmful ones with minimal damage. It is also an opportunity to understand the incompatibility between two or more opinions, principles, or interest. It is an opportunity to understand yourself or others better and to grow from that newfound awareness and resultant compassion. James chapter 1, verses 2 to 4. When all kinds of trials and temptations crowd into your lives, my brothers, don't resent them as intruders, but welcome them as friends. Realize that they come to test your faith and to produce in you the quality of endurance. But let the process go on until that endurance is fully developed, and you will find you have become men of mature character with the right sort of independence. So this is our guiding principle, that when we go through the experiences of conflict and difficulty, we should welcome them as friends, as James here says, and that we should allow ourselves to go through the process so that we may become men of mature character. So the best response to conflict is compassionate curiosity. There is a wonderful TED Talk uh, titled Finding Confidence in Conflict by Kwame Christian. He says that it is more than just semantics, that compassionate curiosity is the best response to conflict. You can be curious without being compassionate. For example, you can ask someone that you disagree with, why are you so stupid? Right? That is not being compassionate, yet you are being curious. Compassionate curiosity fosters a genuine desire to understand. It comes from a place of respect. It comes from a place of genuine curiosity to understand that person's standing, that it is tempered with empathy and respect. And approaching conversations in this way naturally causes you to ask better, deeper, more effective questions and listen to one another more effectively. And what makes this hard, brethren? Why is this such a hard thing to do? Well, what makes this hard is that it requires us to be vulnerable. It requires us to open ourselves up to vulnerability. We need to be willing to suspend judgment and to open ourselves up to the scary possibilities of either being wrong about our stance and our, our conviction or potentially losing a relationship in that circumstance because they're unwilling to see the wrong in their way. So this that is the vulnerable position that you put yourself in this situation. However, slowing down, asking these high-level questions when you feel lost and confused or, or square, scared in conversations, allows you to exercise your prefrontal cortex. And this is where you find logical reasoning. 
I'm a very logical person. I, I deal with things in a very logical manner. And this really speaks to me. And I'm not sure not everyone is of this makeup. And you may find this more or less helpful, but if you practice this, the more that you practice this and you start to build this habit, you realize that it takes pressure off of you in these difficult conversations because your goal in a conversation in dealing with conflict is no longer to teach but to learn in that circumstance and that takes a whole lot of pressure off of you in that circumstance so i need to remind myself that i always have a choice at any moment communicating for outcomes rather than to make myself feel better. And that is the key choice there. We are naturally better at doing this in our professional life than in our personal life. Because as the relationship gets closer, the stakes get higher. There is more to lose. And we find this to be true, regardless of what relationship it is, whether it's at your work with your coworkers, whether it's with your brethren in your ecclesia and outside of your ecclesia, whether it's with your family and children, you find that the closer the relationship gets, the more difficult it is to practice compassionate curiosity. But we don't use compassionate curiosity because it's easy. We use it because the relationship is worth it. So takeaway number two, there is no room for judgment and conflict resolution. Rather, lead with compassion and lead with curiosity. So, brethren, what are we to do in moments of conflict? Let us read from reprint 3123, page 381. Brother Russell writes the following. Since as Christians, we have learned that it is our privilege to be always rejoicing, to rejoice ever more than in and in everything give thanks, we need not, like the world, wait for special manifestations of divine favor to call forth our praise, our homage of heart, and our grateful obedience to the Lord. Rather, learning that divine providence is in all of our affairs, ready to shape them for our good, we may rejoice whatever lot we see, since tis God's hand that leadeth us. So Brother Russell here admonishes us that divine providence is in all of our affairs, according to Romans chapter 8, verse 28. So brethren, if we all know this, if we know this to be true, and if we truly believe that divine providence is in all of our affairs, why is it so difficult at times to rejoice, whatever the circumstances may be? Philippians chapter 4, verse 11. Philippians 4, 11. Apostle Paul himself teaches us his secret. He says, in general, and in particular, I have learned the secret of facing either poverty or plenty. I am ready for anything through the strength of the one who lives within me. Philippians 4, verses 12 to 13. So, brethren, the apostle is not dwelling on the past or on others in these experiences of trial, hardship, and conflict. Rather, he is focused on owning his own attitude. And that is the key for us here as we learn from this lesson. So takeaway number three, don't dwell on the past or on others. Own my own attitude. Now, going back to my work training uh, for a moment, they taught us about the accountability cycle. And this is put together by 
um, Joan Pastor, uh, who has a PhD in industrial organizational uh, psychology and clinical psychology and is a well-known um, uh, author uh, for her executive and leadership development coaching courses. Now, uh, the accountability cycle, uh, it teaches us about its two sides. If you can look at this diagram, there is the top half and the bottom half. The top half is the mastery cycle and the bottom half is the victim cycle. The key choice that determines which cycle you find yourself in is the choice regarding your attitude. Remember takeaway number three, it's about owning our attitude. Well, this diagram shows us that the key choice that determines which cycle you find yourself in is the choice that you make regarding your attitude, acknowledging versus denying the current reality. Now, this is very key because as I mentioned earlier, I have a very analytical, logical, rooted brain. And I, I, I like diagrams a lot and I uh, very much benefit from a very step-by-step -step logical thinking. Well, this was very helpful to me in that perspective because it put a visual in front of me to look at and see the choices that I have. And as you can see here, where the cycle begins is with a choice that we make of either acknowledging or denying the current reality. So what we find is that this stands up against the scrutiny of the scriptures. Let us look back to the example of Apostle Paul and his missionary companion, Silas. Remember when we began this discourse, we found them in the prison, shackled and bound in the inner prison. What choice did they make when the bitter cup of being beaten, mistreated, and unjustly thrown in the inner prison were offered up to them to drink. What choice did they make in this situation? Well, let's go back again to Brother Russell's comments in reprints 3123, page 380. And Brother Russell writes this following, and this is very insightful, and I'd like to read this very carefully. And I quote, it was under these unfavorable circumstances with their backs bleeding and raw from the scourging that reflecting upon the wonders of the divine plan and their own association with that plan, these faithful brethren were so filled with the spirit of rejoicing that they gave vent to their feelings in hymn prayers of thankfulness for their privilege of suffering in connection with the Lord's service of enduring tribulation for righteousness' sake. End quote. Brethren, the apostle and his companion made choices in this circumstance. And Brother Russell very plainly acknowledges acknowledges that this these were unfavorable circumstances. And in these unfavorable circumstances, what did the apostle and his companion choose to do? Well, first, they acknowledged their current reality. They couldn't change the fact that they were in prison. They could not change the fact that they were in shackles. So they acknowledged their current reality. Brother Russell writes, unfavorable circumstances with their backs bleeding and raw from the scourging and unjustly thrown in the inner prison. Well, what else did they do? We see that they have entered into the mastery cycle by acknowledging the current reality. Next, they focused not on placing blame for the circumstances they found themselves in, rather to focus on the situation and their attitudes in reaction to it. So we see that they moved on to the second phase of the mastery cycle. Even though they had no control on the situation, they 
acknowledge the current reality, it was important that they focused not on placing blame. Yes, I am in prison. I can't do anything about it. But am I going to sit here and complain? Am I going to sit here and place blame? Or am I going to focus on the situation? That was the key here. And their attitude is the key here that they displayed in reaction to this circumstance. Brother Russell writes that they reflected upon the wonders of the divine plan and their own association with that plan, and that they were filled with the spirit of rejoicing. They gave vent to their feelings in hymn prayers of thankfulness for their privilege of suffering in connection with the Lord's service, of enduring tribulation for righteousness' sake. Brethren, this, this is remarkable. This shows us the power of our attitude as we go through trials, as we go through these difficult circumstances. How one choice that leads to the next can make a huge impact in our, uh, in our outcomes. So what we see here is if they had denied the situation, and rather focused on blaming others, they would have gone down the path of victims, uh, thinking of themselves as victims, leading to no clear outcome that's beneficial to them in their spiritual life. We read from the words of the psalmist that the steps of a man are established by the Lord when he delights in his way. Psalm chapter 37, verse 23. Brother Russell, again, commenting on this thought, says the following in Reprints 3123, page 381. If we are not ready to praise God where we are, and with our conditions and circumstances as they are, we should not be likely to praise Him if we were differently circumstanced and our conditions just that which now seems to us most desirable. I'm going to take a pause for there. Pause there for a second. Just think about what what we just read. If we were not ready to praise God where we are, and with our conditions and circumstances as they are, we should not be likely to praise Him if we were differently circumstanced, and our conditions just that which now seems to us most desirable. Reading further, Brother Russell writes Daniel could sleep better in the den of lions than Darius in the royal palace. He, who could not find rest in a lion's den, when that was the place for him, could not gain rest by a mere removal to a palace. It is the man's self which must be changed, not his circumstances or his possessions, in order to have in order to his having a heart overflowing with joy and praise, end quote. I'd like to read that last sentence one more time. It is the man's self which must be changed, not his circumstances or his possessions, in order to his having a heart overflowing with joy and praise. What powerful thoughts, brethren. What powerful thoughts. So I ask again, if divine providence is in all of our life's affairs, according to Romans chapter 8, verse 28, brethren, if we all know this, if we truly believe it, that divine providence is in all of our life's affairs, why is it difficult at times to rejoice, whatever the circumstances may be? Philippians 4.11. Why is it so difficult at times to rejoice whatever the circumstances may, may be? It will not be difficult. That's my statement. It will not be difficult. That is what it means to acknowledge the current reality and focus on the situation. So takeaway number four is that accountability cycle and the choices that we have in our life. 
James teaches us that once we are in this frame of mind of acknowledging the current reality, moving down to the path of focusing on the situation, not on placing blame, listening to God for his guidance in how to deal with that circumstance, learning from God in how to deal with that situation, acknowledging success as we act upon what we learned, which leads then to satisfaction and self-esteem and confidence, which will strengthen us again the next time we go through another trial or difficulty. So James teaches us that once we are in this frame of mind, then we can begin to listen for and learn from God's uh, God's wisdom. James chapter 1, verse 5, If any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask God, who gives generously to all without reproach, and it will be given him. So that is the next step once we focus on the situation and not placing blame, is to learn from God. And then it moves us down to acknowledging our success. Proverbs chapter 3, verses 1 to 4. My son, do not forget my teaching, but let your heart keep my commandments for length of days and years of life and peace they will add to you. Let not steadfast love and faithfulness forsake you. Bind them around your neck. Write them on the tablet of your heart so you will find favor and good success in the sight of God and men. So this is what we do when we listen to God's commandments, when we keep his commandments, as we read here, it will lead to favor and good success. And that is the clear outcome for us as we go down this path path of mastering. Next, that leads us to satisfaction and self-esteem. Philippians chapter 3, verse 3. For we are the circumcision who worship by the Spirit of God and glory in Christ Jesus and put no confidence in the flesh. So our confidence and satisfaction is no in no means uh, based on our own ability, but rather acknowledging the fact that we found success by listening to God and His direction and learning from Him and acting upon it. That is what led to success, not on our, not our own ability. And that is the appropriate confidence and satisfaction we must have in our life. So speaking of confidence, the verse that I'd like to quickly read is 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 5. Not that we are sufficient in ourselves to claim anything as coming from us, but our sufficiency is from God. So brethren, there is no self-confidence. There is only confidence through God. So my hope for you is that you are able to use this chart and write down your own scriptures to help you in your time of need. What you see here are the scriptures that I have noted down for each step of this cycle to help me guide myself as we go through this cycle. Because the opposite is to go down the path of victim cycle, which leads to immobilization, inaction, and no positive outcome for any of us. So in conclusion, we read from the words of our dear Lord, John chapter 13, verses 16 and 17. Truly, truly, I say to you, a servant is not greater than his master, nor is a messenger greater than the one who sent him. If you know these things, blessed are you if you do them. So, brethren, we began this hour by looking at how the Apostle Paul and his companion Silas put to practice the spirit of the teachings of Jesus and how they left a wonderful example for us regarding how, while conflict is inevitable, rather than focusing on judgment of others or the conflict that we find ourselves in and how Apostle Paul and Silas did not focus on judgment 
and blaming others, but they focused on the situation and their attitudes in reaction to the circumstances they found themselves in. So when we do the same, brethren, we open ourselves up to the counsel of God, to listen and to learn from him on how to conflict manage in our life. May God overrule anything said amiss and add his blessings. Amen.